My talk is called Stories Stop Silencing. And as I give this talk, I'm, I recall the stories that I've heard and listened and received um, during the, the, the thinking that has led me to uh, reflect on their meanings and also their sufferings. I'm an academic and I specialize in war trauma and I work, work in different countries around the world that have suffered the legacies and traumas of, of war. And in these places, one of the first things that I do is to find uh, the, the names and the, the writings or the legacies, or to listen to the stories of poets that are um, celebrated in, in the countries, often poets that are, are long gone, sometimes poets that have been persecuted, um, in exile, imprisoned, even um, killed because of their writing, because of the the stories of their suffering that they were conveying in the expression, um, whether that's in poetry or whether that's in folk stories or whether that's in memoirs or biographies or historical accounts of their experiences of war. So I started to ask myself, why, why do people tell their stories when they know that silence is their best protection? What do stories do? What are their meanings? Why are we telling these stories? And how can these stories then that are told, that are born from war, can play a role in our humanity and in the ways that we respond to trauma. The, the legacies, the populations, the communities that I, I have spoken to, that I, that I continue to do so around the world, still refer to the, the, the quotes, the scripts, the memories of these storytellers um, in their times of suffering and difficulties because of the reminders of humanity that they the, those stories convey and in the, the role that these stories play in how they respond to their own trauma. So then I started to question whether the stories are part of our suffering or part of our healing. Can they be both? And the, the context that we are going to be thinking about during this talk, particularly around, around war and conflict, the, the meaning of storytellers who become silenced why would a poet become silenced in the midst of a conflict? Why would women be banned from um, reciting poetry or writing poetry in the middle of a, a during a, um, a, a regime um, in, in conflict? So what is it, what meanings, why are they so potent? What can we learn from these stories um, and, and recognize for the importance in how we understand suffering and our traumas? And one of the poets that I, I recollect most often, most like probably is Rabia Balkhi, who was born um, in present day Afghanistan during the ninth century. And uh, even after all of this time, all of these legacies and the, the incredible um, poets that have followed her, she's still celebrated, she's still referred to and spoken to in, in everyday in everyday language, in everyday conversations, um, because of the symbolism that she created through the poetry that she was brave enough to write and to speak. And she's become sy symbolic of women poets around the world, even in, in, in 2021, um, the, the poets who are imprisoned, who are silenced, um, but who continue to, to, to speak their poetry, uh, similar to how Rabia Balki did, uh, she she was killed by her her brother um, because of the person who she chose to love, and uh, as she lay uh, in one of the old um, fa traditional hammam baths where she she had been um, where she'd been mutilated, she continued to write until her dying breath. She used her blood as her ink. She used the the walls of the bath as her as her um, tablet and. The, the because of her the, these words she that continued and have survived um, all of this time following her death her name has yet to fall silent with her words so there's a symbolism here between those who are silenced and those who and, and being silent as well so we often hear these phrases around giving voice to the voiceless well there is no one who lacks a voice in this world but there are um, many examples of structures that silence and the stories that stop silence in other ones that emerge that 
arise from these uh, very extreme contexts um, and uh, of of silencing. Um, so they stories. Why is it that then stories play this integral role? Why is there such a fight to, for stories to survive when it is also the case that the the survival of the the storyteller might not might might be suffered as a result of speaking that story, and the the stories are. Uh, fundamentally an integral part of ourself and the meaning that we ascribe to the world around us. Yet trauma, when we suffer trauma, especially trauma in, in conflict, when we um, we witness the, the surrounding world changing so dramatically around you, trauma challenges both our sense of self and this environment in which we are living in. The, there's a, a difference, there's a rupture in the world that we thought we knew and the world that we did know. Um, and the individuals then who suffer such trauma are faced with finding new narratives, new stories to hold their uh, trauma and to make sense of the, the rupture of the worldview uh, around them. So in this sense, then, there's a, a storification of trauma. War trauma in what it symbolizes, war is a destruction of humanity, war is a destruction of homes, destructions of com communities, destructions of life, destructions of living. So war trauma then is this nemesis of creation, whereas actually storytelling is a form of creating, it's a symbolism of creating, even in the midst of the world um, disappearing um, violently around you. Um, so stories then become captured in these paradoxes, this absurdity, and they, it, the stories reach the existential realm of the ways that we exist in the world. They, they reach the parameters of living, they reach the parameters of dying. And yet, even though these are such poignant, um, potent uh, experiences, there's also uh, an indescribability of the traumas of war that becomes a challenge to express. And this is why the, the storytellers that uh, emerge from these um, experiences are, from, from my eyes, some of the, the bravest we can imagine in, in our world. So silence then becomes potent. It's fertile with stories. Even when someone's silent, they, they, they are they are storytellers still, and they are navigating this traumatized uh, landscape. So this concept then of, of a suffered storyteller, the, the expressions of when you are suffering, when you have a great traumas, then you are going to be uh, the, full of stories. But how, how can we use our stories in these contexts of conflict to, to think about peace, to talk about peace, to bring about, uh, to bring, uh, together broken connections, to, to reform societies, to reform cultures, to find beliefs and hopes again um, after the, the sufferings of war. So in this sense, stories, they, they bring a sense of connectedness. They, there's a sense of sharing, empathy, and these are all components of what makes a community. So stories are, are our fundamental um, building bricks for having communities. Um, and then the, in these contexts, uh, especially when war contains secrets that uh, need to be buried um, by the perpetrators of the violences, of the traumas, of the sufferings, um, speaking those stories, these become the antithesis of silence. Then even when a countries or communities uh, are suffering, uh, or the world is suffering through war, the world can have a sense of self uh, through the aliveness of voice. And as we can see through the legacies, even from poets from thousands of years ago, stories become legacies. Um, but what's important from an ethical perspective as well, to think about the morality of stories and how, how we can improve our world uh, in the future, stories become legacies. And we need to ask who is speaking and who is silenced. Um, and think about those absences as well and who these story, suffered storytellers are and what happens to them. This is part of our moral obligations as well um, for thinking about the, the ways that we um, respond to the sufferings of others around the world who may not be able to express it or uh, are expressing it in very personal um, ways. <laughs> 
So for my role then as an academic um, specializing in transcultural psychiatry and trauma from war, I started to think about how we can use storytelling, especially traditional storytelling, so stories that already exist uh, around us as a form of trauma therapeutic interventions. So biomedical frameworks of trauma therapies are traditionally premised on a very linear narrative of someone's experiences. So thinking about a uh, traumatic event that occurred in the past and how it's impacted on the future and uh, affect, also affecting the, the sense of perceptions um, of the present as well. So, but uh, we also see that in, in war, that there are very complex chronic uh, traumas where we cannot individualize traumatic events in the ways that um, some of the, the biomedical frameworks uh, um, are, are, have been developed on and researched on and premised on. Um, and there's also an idea within these biomedical frameworks that in order to recover, you, the person needs to reconstruct their narrative. In order to do so, they need to actually find a way to expel their story and from the, from the, the moment of the trauma and then the, the, the complete narrative is perceived to be the reconstruction, the recovered narrative. Well, th this is not the way the stories are told um, universally. Um, so we also need to think about other frameworks to, to um, share stories, to, and to conceptualize stories as well. Even the acts of silence, um, these are, as we mentioned, they, these are also full of stories. Um, so even in silence, there can still be recovery. Um, and we, we also need to think about the, these definitions of trauma. Um, it, I've listened to many stories of suffering from around the world, and there's not a universal um, experience or event that you might think of as traumatic. Um, even when the, there might be clearly identified traumatizing events in a person's story, that the, the, the meanings of what might be the traumatizing to that individual is very much connected to their overall, their overarching story. So we, we need to think about what kind of stories then do stop silencing. And this is what led to the, the birth of, um, of Share. So uh, as I mentioned this, I also uh, want, want to honor my, my colleagues because Share is a, a collective group, a collective identity, and uh, it's very symbolic. It means poem in, in many of the, the shared languages of myself and my colleagues. And the acronym um, refers to storytelling for health, acknowledge, acknowledgement, expression, and recovery. So acknowledgement, we recognize the present self. Expression is finding your answer through your own story. And recovery is accepting your the new self. Um, the finding the new stories that have emerged through the, the ruptures of the traumas. So the, these are traditional storytelling uh, therapeutic interventions that have been um, taking place in, in different contexts, um, particularly conflict affected areas and uh, drawing on also traditional stories, stories that exist in the societies as well that relate to the individual's story. So that this collective identity of storytelling is also very important and draws on rich resources um, literary, literary resources um, that survive even in these very harsh environments for creativity during conflict. So the, these alternative stories then, the stories that are expressed um, to, to um, that are represented by suffered storytellers that are um, symbolic of the sufferings of war that contain the secrets, that contain the silences, that contain the, the, the virtues of, of bravery that occur um, in, in the, the telling of these stories. Um, these, are, these stories act as saviors. They, the experience of these stories um, creates the, uh, a backdrop against silencing. And what we also found in, in our work is this, this collective story between, um, between individuals and communities who have experienced silencing. These, um, this collective storytelling, whether it's their own stories 
or whether it's stories that have been um, that uh, adopted into a, th a trauma therapeutic intervention that have been um, drawn on from the historical roots um, of those of those um, individual stories. The, these are expressions that can represent freedom and challenge some of the the harmful ideologies that might be surrounding um, the these the suffered storytellers. Um, as a way for their stories to stop their own silencing. So then stories in uh, conflict offer a space um, um, and uh, a counter narrative to violence to, to produce the narratives that represent the trauma uh, of experiences. Um, and traditional storytelling societies have very rich resources for symbolic stories um, they they uh, they can change who the stories are in society, and changing stories can contribute to um, reforming uh, identities, to an uh, agency, and bringing about social change and transformation, which then can lead into preventing further um, conflicts in the future. So then storytelling interventions uh, for trauma are protective mechanisms against silencing. The stories that we receive, um, whether these are, uh, are gifted in, in an individual encounter or whether they become recognized uh, in, um, in platforms um, uh, in, in, that, in that particular context, these stories uh, that we receive are moral and cultural, uh, cultural artifacts. And we need to find ways that we can receive these stories. I think one of the major challenges that we face um, in our contemporary societies is, is not just about how we express stories of suffering, but how do we receive these stories of suffering? That's the creation of stories against the backdrop of war and violence, are acts of resistance, and an antithesis to destruction. So stories not only stop silencing, but stories actually represent um, creation and represent the ways that we can uh, improve our humanity as we move forwards.